Thank you so much for being here. I'm Monica Munoz Torres, and I'm an associate professor of biomedical informatics at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. I've had the pleasure of being together with this incredible group organizing BOSC uh, since 2015, I believe, when we went to Ireland. Um, over the years, we have been we have been touching on a, on a different different set of subjects and and this portfolio of subjects has uh, I think made us better every time that we address uh, things that are related to open source bioinformatics in different ways um, some of them very much technical but a lot of them in the, they are pertinent to building communities so this time around we wanted to talk about open and ethical data sharing and, and as Nomi likes to say, you know, this conference promotes open source and open science, or, and we're big proponents of this, but we'd love to hear all about tools and frameworks that allow and promote data sharing and reuse. But sharing data openly also has its challenges, right? And so what we would like to do is, is to have a conversation about the successes, the challenges that we find, that we face when we're working with data sharing, what does, it, what does that mean in the context of our own work? And, and we are absolutely privileged to have with us uh, two of our of our keynotes. I hope Joe was able to come, come in. Him. He did? He has a message there to text them with instructions. OK, thank you. So we'll start with the introductions. Thankfully, the majority of you probably saw uh, both of the keynotes and in, in, in have a sense. But we'll start with some introductions as well. And, and so Sara El Gebali is here with us. Joseph Iraqueta is on the on the computer, hopefully coming in. Bastian Grishage says Sovaras. And Verina Raz uh, are joining us today. So what I'm going to ask is for them to share uh, a brief introduction about themselves and the work that they do. We'll try to keep those, I think, two minutes for each of you uh, so that the room gets a sense of, of who you are and what you do and how your work connects to ethics. I know that's a lot for uh, for, for 120 seconds. Yeah. Um, and then then uh, we'd like to open the floor to questions from, from you. I have some thoughts that are specific to things on genomics and ethics and uh, the problem of underrepresentation, for example. So while they're sharing who they are and what they do, I'd like to kindly ask you to start thinking about the questions that you would like to to have this panel address. And so with that, uh, I'll start at the far end of the table. And uh, could I kindly ask you to please sure. introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Verena Das. I am from the University of Cape Town, all the way in South Africa. Um, I'm affiliated with the HCA Bionet, that is a Pan-African Bioinformatics Network for HA Africa. I'm also, of course, by extension, affiliated with HA Africa. We have now recently um, kicked up a whole new consortium known as the Data Science Initiative for Health in Africa. Um, and I form part of the Elwazi Open Data Science Platform within that space. Um, and so a lot of what we're trying to do at the moment is build infrastructure to get Africans using the cloud, um, trying to basically increase their confidence, um, increase their trust in cloud providers, um, and also just increase their ability and their willingness to share their data. Um, they're generating heaps of data, and so we want to encourage them to share. Um, I also chair the sample collection and processing committee within the African Biogenome Project, and there we're focusing on biodiversity collections. Um, and people don't often think that the ethics and the LC issues are just as pronounced within that community, but we are facing pretty much all of the same challenges that the human community is facing at the moment. Um, and so I've been trying to navigate that. I'm, I'm fairly new to the group and the group has just started. Um, I didn't originally sign on to be the chair and I was just kind of thrown into that position. So I've been feeling my way through and probably less experienced than, than the other panelists. Um, so I'm kind of speaking from a, from a newcomer sort of perspective a lot as well. And then I'm also involved in fair training community. Um, I've been building a fair checklist for training materials because I'm very passionate about verifying training materials. And that also comes with um, interesting challenges that I'm happy to share. Thank you. And now Sarah. Um, hi. Can you, can you, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Hi. Um, I'm Sarah. 
Sarah El Gabali. I am a project leader for metadata and curation at the Scilab Lab and in Sweden. I'm also the founder of Fair Points, which is a community-driven uh, initiative to um, highlight the efforts into fair implementation from a global perspective. So, how does fair translate into real life for everybody around? <coughs> um, I'm also as I'm interested in, in how this application is, is uh, done in real life and how it assists people in different places in, uh, in the world, um, I am uh, also um, implement this part of this knowledge into as being um, as my within my role as a technical advisor for the African Persistent Identifier Alliance initiative, which uh, aims to preserve um, African cultural heritage uh, by minting uh, persistent identifiers and enriching this with metadata to create fair digital objects, um, which is related also to my position or my role within the steering committee of the fair digital objects to ensure that all of this experiences and, and global experiences are integrated in how we design technology. So how do we make technology from the early on, from the start, that is fit for everybody and not just an afterthought after the process. So, thank you. Okay, then, oops, I go next. I um, have been at BOSC for as, nearly as long as you would think. Like, I think 2015 was my first BOSC as well, and I saw you moderating a panel, and now I'm on a panel with you. <laughs> so I'm BOSC, and I'm a senior researcher at the Ellen Turing Institute in London and working on participatory citizen science. Some of you might have heard my talk earlier today on, like, a co-created citizen science project on autism, but I've been doing citizen science in like the wider space of biology <laughs> since 2011 and like all around like co-creating citizen science for collecting data that's both useful to researchers, but also the communities on which we collect data. All of this started in 2011 with like a little platform called OpenSNP, where we asked people that have 23andMe or other con direct to consumer genetic testing data to put it out in the public domain and just like donate, made it accessible for everyone. It's still going on. I think we have now around 6,000 data sets, and it's like the very far end of open data sharing where. We inform people of all the potential risks. Are you still crazy enough to donate to the public domain? Go ahead, and if not, please don't. Then after that, I joined an organization called Open Humans in the US, where we have like a similar approach to like collecting data from genetic data over wearables, continuous glucose monitoring data, all of this, but on a granular consent level where people can have this data privately in their own vault, and then they can share data with projects as they want to use it. And yeah, we've done many different research projects by collecting data like this. So the one I presented today on autism actually uses open humans for giving people this granular consent for sharing their individual experiences and sensory processing with others. We've done one two years ago by now where we co-designed a research project with a group of trans women from all across the European Union to collect neo-vaginal microbiome data because trans women can get vaginal infections and actually a student from our university said this is a big issue because if I as a trans woman go to the gynecologist no one can help me as no one even knows how the healthy microbiome is supposed to look like. So we started designing a study with this community to really not only collect data for us as researchers, which we love, but also to really give this data back to the individuals and say, this is your microbiome data, you can use it whatever way you want, and here's the insights we have so far. And yeah, that's the, the type of research that I'm doing and working on generally, and like between the ethical and open data sharing and really negotiating who's benefiting from the data. Thank you, Bastian. Uh, Joe, are you? I saw that your video was on a second ago. Uh, are you able to join us and share a little bit about, uh, you know, share your institution and your work as it relates to open science and, and ethics uh, briefly? Yeah, um, my name is Joseph Shetta. I'm from the Native Biodata Consortium. We're located in uh, the north central part of the United States, <laughs> otherwise known as the Midwest or the Great Plains uh, on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. Um, I and lots of my colleagues 
uh, are trying to protect the data, uh, human and plant and microbiome for Amer indigenous people, uh, mostly because in many parts of the world, um, when uh, colonialism ended, um, like say for instance, India, um, they got their country back and, and they're, they're independent and they have some autonomy on what they do in their own country. That is not the case for the Americas. Um, you know, Western European descendants still occupy much of the Americas and in the places that they don't, like Latin America, uh, the indigenous people of those countries um, are having their knowledge um, sort of extracted from them, whether it's plant knowledge or fish knowledge or soil knowledge, or even their human uh, DNA. And we know uh, that Native Americans uh, went the farthest and furthest, I'm sorry, the farthest and quickest from Africa uh, in very small numbers and had a population explosion here uh, in this hemisphere. And there are, there's been lots and lots of studies that says their genome is unique, not only uh, because of its evolutionary history and this uh, sort of bottleneck history, there's been at least five bottlenecks, uh, but because um, they basically adapted to a new human environment that no hominid had ever uh, been uh, privy to before. So there's all kinds of things um, unique to the Americas that are worth both scientific um, wealth and, and monetary wealth. So we're just trying to protect all of that data, um, especially, like I said, because there isn't one country except for Bolivia in the Americas that is run by indigenous people. Thank you, Joe. Well, as this is, as you see, we, we did our best to try to find professionals from uh, from a diverse back from diverse backgrounds that could give us perspectives on on several different aspects of of working with open science and, and open data, uh, and then project a perspective on the challenges, uh, specific challenges that they're facing in their parts of the world and in their work. So now that we know who you are, I would like to to ask you to share with the with the audience um, as we try to think about the ethical challenges that that we face in your particular uh, work. I would like for you to share, perhaps if if you can give us the the strongest or or, or the most salient challenge that you're facing right now. Uh, maybe you have a success story about the positive change that has occurred because of the work that you do, or maybe you want to focus on what the challenge itself is in, in, in what you think would be the best way to bring about a solution. Does that make sense? One challenge, uh, one way to address, or rather, uh, what has been the success story? So if that's fair, then um, how about we start the other way around? So Joe, if that's okay, I'll start with you first and give you an opportunity to share uh, a little bit more about one of your challenges and, and ways to address or where it has been a success. Um, one challenge is um, the Euro colonial borders that exist in the Americas. Um, so in my talk earlier, uh, First Nations in Canada um, to some extent, uh, people in Hawaii and American Samoa, Alaska, and the United States have a recognized sovereignty. And even though there is some violations uh, of that sovereignty and um, sort of removing or extracting their resources, at least there is some legal redress um, through treaty law and through constitutional law. In most of Latin America, that doesn't exist. And the concept of mestizaje, um, if anybody's familiar with it, uh, I've had to suffer with it my whole life because I'm a very indigenous looking person. Other Latinos do not accept me as a Latino or Hispanic. They make decisions on behalf of indigenous people because they share ancestry, but they don't share the culture and they don't share the mindset. Uh, so that is a, is a big challenge in terms of trying to reclaim or rejuvenate or uh, restore native cultures uh, with whatever means possible in one way is, is resources. Um, so right now, um, we haven't solved that challenge other than uh, I'm part of something called the Summer Internship for Indigenous People in Genomics, which started at the University of Illinois and then expanded to the University of Alberta in Edmonton, and then um, the University of Waikato in New Zealand with the Maori, and it's at Deakin University in Australia. 
we had a sing mexico this january uh we are well we kind of had a sing chile we're gonna have a sing chile this this winter um we're possibly having a sing greenland and sing hawaii and sing uh, pacifica so training more um students uh from these indigenous groups who have an indigenous mindset, who want to do for their own communities, protect their own resources. And um, like I said, uh, come out from under colonialism. Um, that's that's our solution for now. And, and we've been doing this since 2010. Uh, and I think we've graduated about 40 PhD students. So it's, it's going well. That's wonderful, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think like one big challenge is that I see in like the space of like the engaging with communities is like really the how it, how to make it accessible for a diverse range of participants as like if you don't do this you end up having again like a very biased set of people that you engage with which might not be representative for the larger community like in the case of like doing a project on autism the people we interact with and that contribute are the people that are able to speak, that are able to participate in online meetups, that are able to potentially use GitHub and submit issues. So it's like a very biased set and like people in the community recognize that, for example, how do we engage with people that cannot read or write, that cannot speak? How do we represent their voices? But then you have the trade off that people say, well, then we need to allow people to like parents, caretakers speak on these people's behalf. But this is really problematic if like, how can these people realistically speak for their children or the people they need to care of and how representative is this data on the other hand? So mm -hmm. it's really hard to solve this. And I think like we see similar issues like in the project we did on trans women or with trans women where like, it's like, well, how much of this is, we get like the people that like, it's like the most boring stereotype, but all the trans women in tech that participate in a cool microbiome study, if the majority of trans women that live in Paris probably are very highly marginalized sex workers living on the streets, they will not participate in research studies because we cannot reach them easily. How do we make it inclusive for communities we cannot easily reach? And I think we are trying really hard to think about these issues. And I think that's our biggest success that we are aware of where we are falling short. It's like at least a lot better than many other research studies are doing, but I don't think we have found the solution for this just yet. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, would you mind pulling that closer yeah, to Sure. Um, so, so one of the challenges is um, lack of trust compounded with the lack of legislations. And I'll give an example to illustrate this concretely. When dealing with, um, from the African and Middle East perspective, that's we're interacting with, with the West and or within our community, like um, coming into contact with populations and community members from there. When we talk about open science, it's open science from a Western lens. It does not take into account their fears on how the data is handled. And it doesn't take into account the presence and the lack of certain legislation. So for instance, take having conversation with the university in Egypt, um, they, do, they do have strict regulations of not to share anything outside of the university. However, on a, on, a, on a national level, there is no legislation or policies or even a thought about uh, how data and um, research outputs are going to be handled. So you have this mistrust that is causing a lot of fear for a good reason. I'm not, you know, I'm not talking, uh, talking about or going to start to, 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 to discuss it. But so you have all of these issues that leave uh, a gap, basically, which makes it harder when we're dealing when we come in with our frameworks and strategies and infrastructures and and asking for similar um, or equivalent practices yeah. uh, so uh, you 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 can't align the, the two um, and then slowly there there is awareness but on an african level there's no for instance there's no legislation here in in, in europe you have GDPR, you have HIPAA. So at the end of the day, you know that there is some concrete, you know, laws behind it. However, when you look at the African context, 
there's none. So even when you have initiatives like African Persistent uh, Identifiers um, Alliance, Africa Pet Alliance, <laughs> easier, um, when when they're looking to adopt the same strategies as the West, there are certain uh, there come, there's a lot more challenges into are we allowed to save this data um, like in a, in a repository and where is that repository at and what can we do and what can we not can we not do luckily with this with, with consultation work with the with the group we found like concrete solutions and and having storage within Africa on a Kenyan level and on Kenya but it's a local level so it's not African wide, so, so you know, there's always like if one of those countries that their data is stored there starts making legislations and others don't, I mean, it's it's, it's gonna implode at some point. But so you have you have to raise awareness. You have to work with the communities, especially the communities that need to make a change and empower them to make a change on a legislative level. So you have to to treat the fear. And, uh, and empower. Thank you. Very yeah, so maybe just to follow on from what Sarah said, I think within the HA Bionic community, that is probably one of our main challenges is getting researchers to share their data. Um, it's a requirement, it's, it's NIH funded, and so it has to go into the EGA, um, but getting them to give us the data to eventually submit to the EGA is really, really difficult. Um, there's lots of studies who had meant to submit their data already that we're still struggling to get the data. And the main reason is just trust. They ask, you know, they, they're worried about the fact that the servers, that the data is going to be sitting on the repositories, they're sitting in Europe, they're sitting in America, they're not in Africa. Um, and so that was a, a, a major challenge, I think, for the community. But I think HA Bionet and HA Africa really did a lot of work in negotiating with the NIH. Um, negotiating with authorities and developing unique policies that really just focused on protecting Africans and their data. Um, they set up unique policies that I think were, were really pioneering, in my opinion. Um, they did things like, for example, um, all of the data, copies of the data need to be kept on the African continent. So if anything happens internationally, laws change, Africans don't lose access to the data, which has been an issue historically. Um, they, we've also developed the HA Africa Data Archive, which allows for us to actually facilitate the, the, um, the submission to the EGA. So we do the data harmonization, we do the quality control, the validation. Um, this is all done with encryption. It's all done in faults, in cold storage. <laughs> there's, there's lots of, of policies that have been developed around that. Um, and one, one thing that, that I found really interesting was that we also still, on top of that, have embargo periods. So even when it goes to the EJ, it's access controlled, but there's a nine to 10 month embargo so that the African scientists actually get the first opportunity to analyze their data and publish their papers. Um, there are also clauses. So I think for about a period of three to four years, if anybody outside of Africa wanted to access that data, they needed to say how they would work with an African scientist and how they would feed back into capacity development for the African community. And that was a requirement. So you couldn't just take the data and just go in and analyze it and publish. You had to work with an African scientist. And also, I think a very unique thing that, that the NIH did with HR Africa was that all of the primary funding actually went to the African data, the African scientists. And so they could really direct what they actually needed to do with that money. They could, you know, resource the projects or the components of the projects that really needed the resources, that really needed the money, which wasn't always the case when the money was going to a, a PI that was sitting in the US or a PI that was sitting in Europe. Often the money went there and they never gave any money to the African PIs, but they were still expected to meet their deliverables. And so that it just destroyed trust. And so HA Africa really had this humongous task of rebuilding that trust. And I think we've made a lot of strides, um, but now I'm seeing similar challenges with Awazi. Um, we were hoping to really have some data on the platform. The climate groups are very happy to share their data because their data is, is fairly open anyway, um, but we're still having trouble getting people to put their data on there because it's called the Open Data Science Platform. They're really worried about who's gonna get access and what they're gonna do with that data. Um, so we're doing GA for change federated access, passports, federated analysis. And there's lots of development happening um, that go way beyond my domain as well. And so I work in the capacity development sort of part of things. I'm a program manager over there. Um, so I'm trying to develop 
essentially training and capacity building programs that will capacitate African scientists to also analyze their own data. So it doesn't have to be analyzed by anybody else. Um, so I think we've we've done a good job, in my opinion, <laughs> um, over the last 10 years. But I think we've just scratched the surface. All there's so many issues that I think we still have to dive into. Thank you. Uh, can I have that? Thank you so much for sharing those perspectives. So I would like, to, did I get Joe? Yes, he was the first one. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I was getting signaled that I hadn't done it. Um, and there are some comments I see on the on the side that Joe was sharing with us. If you cannot read it, it says, because of CAFTA and NAFTA, many more indigenous Central Americans are making it to the USA and being exploited both as migrant workers and uh, for their genetics. There's no protection outside of government funding. Andres Moreno just published tons of Latin American data in conjunction with Chan Zuckerberg. Uh, see what she, is, oh, and, and then he's commenting on what uh, Verina is saying about, see what you are saying it's possible because African countries exist and have a recognized government and where indigenous people don't have that luxury. Um, Thank you so much for that perspective. Additionally, Joe, I would like to open the floor uh, and, and, and give an opportunity to you sitting in the audience if you have some thoughts, some questions, some comment. Uh, I'd like to open the floor to you. Uh, this is Jason, and I, I, I think my, my comment or question is sort of an extension of what I said uh, in the question I had earlier during Joe's talk, which is, you know, how do we, you know, we, we are, we're individual raindrops in the flood. Uh, and it's very hard for any individual person to know, you know, what's our responsibility or are we doing something unintentionally that is actually harmful? And it's so abstract to us that we don't realize that. Or, you know, what other behaviors are we doing actually is the right thing to do. And so... You know, there's, I, I'm not aware of, and other people can correct me if I'm just not aware, which happens frequently. Um, what is sort of the ethical code of practice for a biomedician? Uh, that, you know, as a physician, you know, there's, there could be an oath or uh, as in different areas, there are certainly ethical codes of conduct that, that apply. And we've heard some examples in Joe, Joe's talk, for sure. There were some other talks uh, across Basque, which might have touched on points close to this. But uh, is that something that's needed in your opinion? Or do you have uh, an ethical code of conduct for biometricians that you uh, rely on? So that's a question <laughs> at the end there. Thank you, Jason. So um, from here on, we have approximately 20 more minutes, 24 more minutes to talk. So um, I'll take one or two responses from the panel and then move on to the next question so that we have more space. Uh, would one of you, Joe, Verena, Hisara, to, uh, Bastian, would like to share an answer? Who has that code of color? Or has thought about it? Well, Verena, I mean, you look like you have. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm really answering the question, but um i think it's needed definitely i don't think we have it at the moment but i think that our policies within our organization are so ironclad at the moment that you you have to follow them and you cannot do something without supervision or oversight or a checkpoint um, and those checkpoints help those checkpoints help protect the data they help um you know ensure that the data is being used the way that it's supposed to be used and so i think we have a database um, access committee, for example, that controls access to all data. Um, whenever you want to use any data coming out of, out of the community, you have to actually stipulate how the data is going to be used already, and that needs to be pre-approved before you can get access to the data. Um, so in that way, I guess there's a bit of data stewardship there, but I think the bioinformaticians themselves, they get told, run an analysis and I want the result, and they give you the result. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a space that needs to be developed definitely because I think there's there are often times that things are done with data that I don't think bioinformaticians realize the downstream implications if they're not from like a public health background, for example. I don't want to speak without the microphone, but part of it is that you know any given project you might have to have the bear project. And I'm talking as a no, there's not. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> my add, my, my, my add on to that because I agree with what you say. Some projects might be really advanced, but my, my point is also that, it, like, just like you said at the end there, it has to transcend projects. It has to be as soon as you get, you take on this label, 
you have your own independent guidance on this that transcends a project or country. Now it needs to be informed by that project or country because they may have, or the people who own the data may have specific things that they want you to do when you're working with their data, but how do we get it to transcend what happens to be the case on any given project? I think Joe uh, turned on his video. Did you have some thoughts you wanted to share too? No, I just wanted you to see my beautiful face. No. Oh, thank you, Joe. You are gracing us. Uh, Sarah, Bastien? Uh, I, I was going to say something. Um, Sorry, go ahead. So I, I think one interesting thing that's happened recently. So in the United States, we have something called Bridge to AI. And um, these are large um, projects with six different universities and other institutions. And it's very uh, cross-disciplinary with the aim of being um, transdisciplinary. And I think that what is happening or what I see is happening is that the bar fermenticians tools and ethics um, have for a long time played second and third fiddle to the data collectors. So if it's MDs at the clinic or it's PhDs, um, you know, collecting samples somewhere else, um, they usually sort of frame the ethics of the project. And, and as you said, the bioinformaticians just get the data and do their job and then that's it. They don't really, they don't really have a, a personal code or even input to the project with, but with Bridge to AI, what's been, because it's supposed to be uh, interdisciplinary, they've been teaming up and, and I mean, it's not good right now because there's been um, sort of some infighting between um, standards and data collection um, with the other three components, which is um, teaming tools and ethics. So I, I don't know if that's going to kind of that model is going to spread around the world, but the uh, transdisciplinarity, I think, does give bioinformaticians a, a voice and a, a space to provide input. Thank you, Joe. I'll, I'll sit myself in, next to Bastian so you can see my my face uh, as I thank you <laughs> for the. Uh, so I happen to be the uh, co-chair of the steering committee for Bridge to AI, and and I and I do believe that working on data ethics and people at the core, as the beginning and the end of everything that we do, is is. Uh, it's a good way to get started. As you said, we have ways to go and our work cut out for us, but uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we uh, move forward. And I'll keep you in mind and in touch. Um, thank you so much, Joe. So do we have any other, do we have another question, another follow-up from the audience? Yes, thank you. Give me one second. Hey, I'm uh, Steven. So last week I was in more clinical conference and the issue there was that there was just nobody in certain marginalized communities being enrolled in studies. So there was no data being collected, no data being studied. So like ethically, which would you consider as worse? Uh, there being no study of certain types of data or the data that's being studied potentially being misused. Who would like to start with that? Uh, maybe Sarah, Bastian, go ahead. I was just thinking, like, you're giving two, two extreme options here, and there is a sweet spot in the middle where <laughs> you can keep everybody happy by actually by doing meaningful um, consent information and building the trust. So one of the issues is that if you don't see someone from your community in the in the role in in the healthcare role, you, you immediately don't trust that because you, you're not there's the lack of representation so um i i don't believe in in, in having those extremes it's, i i think there we all we have to do better in order to prevent these two situations from actually happening yeah yeah and maybe just to like I totally agree. I think there's also the aspect that like it's easy to complain about people not enrolling in the studies, but then like if we think of like many of the big data sets which have like some representation of otherwise underrepresented minorities, the first thing researchers do is just like drop all of the data that's not white Europeans because then you have a better signal. So it's like it, it's in a way even like worse. Like you ask people to contribute to your study, and now they go through the whole process. They give their samples, and they are enrolled in this, and give you all their data. 
and then no researcher wants to use it because you are still the minority in the data set, <laughs> which like happens far too often somehow. So I think like, I, I agree in the sense that like, I think it needs to be research done by these communities on their own data to actually figure anything out. And like by just the majority researchers enrolling a more diverse sample in many cases will not be a real solution. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have another perspective on the panel? Oh, and there's a question on the floor, please. Uh, I was just still thinking about actually your, your question before, Jason. Uh, sorry, I'm George from Max Planck in Cologne. Um, you know, I was thinking if we would go around the, the building today and would ask bioinformaticians, uh, what do they know about GDPR and human genomic data? I think there will be a lot of stalled faces <laughs> having no idea what, what to say at all. And uh, I think it's, it's a big problem because these are the people that can create solutions, but they don't even know that there is a problem. <laughs> they, don't, they heard about it, okay, for sure, but the, the technicalities and et ethical part, they don't know. So I think we need to kind of bring more information, you know, uh, to these computers, I'm going to say the street, but it's the computers, <laughs> uh, and, and inform them like what's going on with genomic data and why is it dangerous to share it and what is like what what can happen when you you misuse it, um, so that they can start thinking about. It. But I want to analyze this data and I have an idea on how to fix this. You know, this is basically you know what open source is all about at the end of the day, right? It's it's clear everyone can contribute. People see the problems, bring in solutions. Yeah. Maybe I want to to, to, this, to the, the question of like the code of like ethics or code of conduct. I think like it's not not, not only bioinformatics; it's like software engineering as a whole that like really likes doing this. Like, if like civil engineers would be working like software engineers, would you go on over any bridge? If the aviation engineers would be working like we are, would you go on a plane? No, like not, none of us would. Like somehow we've carved out this niche for us where we said like. Like no warranty, you just use this as is and everything is fine. And turns out it's really not. <laughs> so I think like as you said, like it's it's on us to really do better. And I think like it's the the engineers that need to really push this forward in a way. <laughs> and no one really has beyond like these individual solutions. And yeah, <laughs> we need to do better. Thank you. Uh again on my question. <laughs> Sorry, just because of your point about GDPR, it caught my attention, um, which is the thing about GDPR is it's complex. It's tough to understand, especially for someone who's a software developer. Uh, I had to go through this a year ago, uh, and I realized that it's not, even the lawyers have trouble understanding it, not the GDPR that is defined, but rather how it's being implemented in member states within Europe. And uh, now imagine a developer or a data steward or a data manager trying parse all of that complexity, I think we can do better, yes. And, and I think we could leverage existing resources that we have to break down the interpretations of GDPR on a country basis and how it affects each country with their data sharing initiatives, which is important because I've seen projects stalled for three years because they couldn't get around their interpretation of GDPR and realizing that their original goal, goals would never succeed given the the in the full interpretation of gdpr so yeah i think we can do better uh but i also need help from outside our domain not just technical but also legal i mean i'm sure that was obvious but just i want to highlight that <laughs> thank you deepak um do we have one more comment on gdpr are either of you or joe um i'm close just to that line. thank you so much kind of want to say like what i'm hearing is like it takes a village to actually get this done together so well, we and we need to raise awareness early on we need to integrate this with alongside proper good practices for data management have that as courses and electives and undergrad that's what we're trying to motivate to bring in data management and alongside that also the ethics so we're not just teaching about fair but we're also teaching about care and other concepts and and highlighting the problems as you mentioned so but that together with community cultures and 
better understanding will help the legislation as well shift. So that's where we leverage our our positions into changing the environment around us. So um, I, I think it's an interplay and really takes a village of a lot of different people. <laughs> Thank you. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think uh, part of the problem, at least in the United States, is uh, Congress. So uh, there's been more and more sort of micromanagement from Congress over the NIH. And I think that's bad for science. I don't think non-scientists should be managing these types of things. And then the, where it comes down to is uh, data is the deliverable and nothing else seems to be. Even though there's been money for ethics, law, social impact research, that money's been dwindling and it's even been called um, by the NH to stop funding it altogether. And so if we're going to do this and enter into this new era, they should be funding innovation and development of those other disciplines in order to do this well. Um, you know, a lot of these projects are under sort of a corporate umbrella, which academics usually balk at anyway, uh, and these these um, sort of milestones and timelines, which are not conducive to uh, interdisciplinarity. So I, I think that some of that has to happen at the uh, upper levels of, of Congress and, and the NIH. That's right. I, I agree with you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we have a question from the panel. Thank you, Jason. Sorry, from the back, to the back. <laughs> Your name first, please. Yes, hello, so my name is Leonor. I'm at the Bioinformatics School Facility at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, so recently at the University of Copenhagen, there was a course created for everybody, all types of employees related to GDPR. And that was useful, but I'm lacking some material that is more specific for bioinformaticians. And I was wondering whether you know if there isn't any material available online or something that could be helpful for bioinformaticians. Thank you. Uh, who would like to take that answer? <laughs> uh, I don't know, Joe, if you can see the panel, but they're looking at each other and shaking their head. No. Everyone is just proving Deepak's point on like no yeah. one knowing how to deal with yeah. it. <laughs> but I do want to say, HA Bionet does run a foundational data management course, and we do touch on GDPR and um, various other data protection standards. It's probably not at the complexity that you're going to need, um, but I felt like it was a good primer, particularly if you didn't know very much about it. And a lot of those materials, um, so I haven't spoken about our fair practices for training very much, um, but one thing that HA Bionet does do is we try to verify our training materials and training resources. Um, so we submit a lot of our materials to um, repositories. We apply bioschemas so that you know web scrapers can find it. So a lot of our courses are indexed in things like um, the test platform, um, goblet scrapes, um, scrapes for the schemas, and so pulls in a lot of that content. And so I just wanted to say that there is potentially content online, but it's difficult to find it. Um, so I'm kind of switching the, the, the topic a little bit um, to education right now, because that's kind of a field that I'm also very passionate about. And so I want to advocate for education and open training resources as well. Um, if you have good training resources and you know you've developed it well and you've prepared it well and it would be useful to the community, I would like to encourage you to share those materials. Think about how you can create those materials under things like Creative Commons licenses. Things, think about submitting those materials to open repositories so that other people can find them um, to make them more findable and accessible. Um, so, I mean, I, I want to advocate and maybe just ask the, the group here, you know, a lot of us do work and we create all these wonderful materials that get presented once for one week and then it goes into a black box and nobody ever sees it again. Um, so for people like you that are looking for high quality materials, I would like to say, please look at fair, starting to verify your training materials. If you're not too familiar with it, there's a whole fair training handbook that has just recently been released. We're working on a fair training checklist. So you can actually apply um, the, the RDA fair principles to training as a data type. Um, and so, so that it can help the community um, in finding high quality training resources. And in that way, also foster a bit of open training and you know, yeah, open educational resources. Thank you, Marina. Jason? Uh, so just a comment, uh, an observation that this is not a classroom. 
Uh, we have learned a lot over the last couple of days, and there's more days of the conference, but this is a professional society. And as a professional society, uh, we can actually take actions as a professional society. So the people here are not here to sort of, oh, yeah, that's a problem. That's really bad. Somebody should do something about it. But this is a professional society, which means that they can make recommendations. They can take policy stances, right? Uh, so that, yes, training, it, it's very instructive that we do have tutorials that go on in this professional society. We have education tracks, and that's great. But where is the policy making track? And where is the forum to actually sort of say that uh, ISCB will do that? And that's really all up to you. If you think that these are actual problems that you're hearing, um, then what would it mean uh, for this group to form policies uh, based upon what we've heard at this and other places so that when a group wants to go in a way that is unethical or when a country wants to make a recommendation that's not um, and what we know to be uh, right, then bioinformaticians individually could choose not to work on those projects or uh, policy may be shaped in a different way. So it's an observation that you can take how you want. Thank you. That's a very good call. Um, would either, would any of you four would like to share some additional thoughts on that? Oh, and there's one more comment from Tarsisio. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Actually, it's because now I'm think my background is like in computer engineer, and uh, I also did like in, in different countries. I have a double diploma, like uh, in Brazil and in France. And uh, at, at that time, actually, we had like at education level, like have classes and the, actually the whole whole discipline about intellectual property and how to make patents because there's a commercial purpose for industry and so on. And but I'm not aware. Maybe there is some university doing like education level also to have like. A, dedicate disciplines for data protection and uh, and so on. But I'm not fully aware. Maybe you have some comments on it, because I, I, I was thinking that maybe it's also a good direction like to, to have this at the university level as, well, like, like, as a training uh, discipline as well. Oh, where did our... Thank you. <laughs> uh, would any of you four would like to, Sarah? Do you sound, look like you want to answer? Yeah, I was just saying, like, if you look at um, at all of these professions, whether data protection or data management, we're pretty new with that. So, having the education catch up with, with with these new professions and these new issues is a challenge in itself. But there is there is a movement in the right direction. So there are a lot of people who are putting together curriculums for data management, for good data practices, for data protection, well, the basics, but we rely on professional people who understand the regulatory, regulatory um, restrictions and how to interpret the law, because that's a, that when it comes to more specific advice or guidance, then you need other people in your, in, 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 uh, in your framework. But uh, just trying to say, like, if you look at Elixir, the work is done there on, in capacity building on training, specifically when it comes to research data management and good data practices, there is work being done, but it needs time to catch up because we haven't been around for too long. Thank you. I have a question for, uh, I actually have a question for you, Joe about, I just wanted to use the last few minutes of, of, our, uh, of our panel to, in, to invite a, a little bit of an expansion on something that you were mentioning earlier. So we know very specifically that um, genetics and genomics research in humans is, is fundamentally dependent on being able to leverage uh, genetic diversity. And, and in order to do so, you know, we want to do this because we want to contribute to uh, identifying disease risk and, and resilience and enabling diagnosis. But the problem of the inadequate representation of people of non-European ancestry means that there's incomplete understanding of genetic diversity. And so ideally, uh, we've told ourselves that the representation of the diverse communities is important so that we can bring the benefits of, of, of genetics and genomics to, to all. And I would like to, sh to just hear a few more thoughts from, from this framework that you were discussing earlier uh, when we were sharing the talk 
on, on how to do that in an ethical manner, in a responsible manner, and in a respectful manner to integrate the communities. Uh, if you'd like to share a few more thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I don't know that I can. I mean, sorry to be pessimistic, but I think the whole um, framework is is cockeyed. Um, I had the benefit of working with Wiley Burke and Milia Fullerton and, and lots of other uh, great ethicists and social determinants researchers and social determinants and the microbiome is way more predictive of health than genetics. Um, so by emphasizing on DNA, um, I think we should be focusing on metabolomics and proteomics and, and, and the microbiome and all of these exposures rather than, than DNA. I mean, a lot of it is social, a lot of it is economic, a lot of it is racial. Um, so I, I think that there has to be more emphasis on prevention and um, reduction of exposures and those kinds of things. So, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't really have an answer for you. I, and I like... <laughs> I like Jason's comment because um, it we are the ones, we're the scientists, right? We're the ones to make the recommendations. And with Bridge to AI, um, people are always kind of cowering to the NIH. And I'm like, no, the, it says right in the RFA, you are the experts. They want you to come up with a solution. The NIH isn't going to come up with a solution. They want you to come up with the solution. You're the expert. You're the one to make mm -hmm. recommendations. And I just looked in several different places on the internet and I can't find an ethical guideline for bioinformaticians that it doesn't exist. I haven't found one. So we should recommend that we need to create one or do some work to get one. Um, the other thing is I said earlier in my talk is scientists have underpowered themselves. You know, they, they, they can take bigger, stronger stances. Like one of them right now is with uh, the whole Jed match thing and 23andMe and Ancestry.com and whether or not you're going to let law enforcement um, violate that trust with the company, right? You paid to send your uh, sample to 23andMe. You didn't pay to have one of your relatives go to jail. It's, so my my um, law friends are like they have they're going to get there eventually, but they think that those things like Jed Match and the Golden State Killer uh, represents at least constitutionally in the United States it represents illegal search and seizure. So we as scientists have to do something to get in the way, right? We have to say something. Mm -hmm. We are now entering a new uh, era of surveillance, and we are the ones providing that data. So we have to Thank say. You. Thank you, Joe. Um, that and earlier we learned that you know we need to train more students with indigenous roots to try to help their own communities. Um, Bastian also talked to us about how research practices need to be accessible for participation from a more diverse range of individuals. Uh, Sarah stressed to us that the lack of trust is compounded with the lack of, of uh, legislation and that this needs to be addressed in order to, to have better practices. Verena was, was telling us about how getting researchers to share the data is so hard that building trust and immers immersing yourself into those, those communities to, uh, is, is one of the keys in order to be able to achieve this. We heard a call to to peaceful arms, to draw policies, to regulate how groups that are not following ethical code of conducts and, and, re and regulations can be uh, declined or, or, you know, or to be able to create an ethical guideline for bioinformaticians. So I hope that you walk away from here with some ideas on how to uh, participate, to contribute, to make it this also part of, of your daily work. I'm so grateful to Joe, Verena, Sarah, and Bastian for being here today, for sharing your thoughts with us. And to each of you for taking the time to appreciate this panel, uh, sharing your thoughts and asking your questions. Thank you. Yeah.